few announcements this morning. I guess the blood mobile is here today. Is that right? Uh, so if you have an opportunity, uh, I can't remember how long it stays, but if you have an opportunity, uh, try to uh, swing by there after our service this morning. Uh, be a, it's a good way to serve and love on people you know, through the giving of blood. I know there's always a need. Uh, also, a few other announcements. Uh, to, Tuesday, June 7th, we have a VBS meeting. Um, Vacation Bible School is a week from tomorrow, which is crazy uh, if we think about Um, And so there is a lot that needs to happen to take place uh, on that note. Um, So Jennifer, I got this. You don't trust me to remember anything, which is totally understandable. Um, But... uh, the, 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 I think the biggest needs uh, for Vacation Bible School at this point, I think most of the, the gaps have been filled, teacher spots and whatnot, uh, but they need help with, with rec. So if there's anyone in here who's like, that sounds like something I want to do, um, helping with rec, or then also uh, help, helping in the sound booth. Mr. Mike Carlisle is going to California on Vacation Bible School week, so he won't, he won't be here. So. Uh, we need help um, in the sound booth with, with slides during the worship rally, um, and then I think maybe during um, the worship class. So if, if there's anyone in here who, who feels as though that's something they would like to do, but they don't know how to do, I'm here all week and I can show you how to, to do it. it. It really is not all that difficult, um, but uh, those are kind of the two, two biggest things, I think, at this point that Jennifer needs help with. I'm sure there are other things, and so if, if those two things don't fit, um, perhaps um, we can get you plugged in somewhere else. Uh, so that's that. Next Saturday and Sunday are decoration days. Uh, so it says Saturday, June 11th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., and then Sunday, June 12th, after the morning worship service, uh, there is uh, decoration things that need to happen. Uh, VBS Family Night, of course, that is always the Wednesday night of Vacation Bible School. Uh, many things. So I know that men work during the day, so they can't typically be here unless they have a, a job that can accommodate this uh, during the day. Uh, but during the evening on Wednesday night, there's always help that needs needs to be always things that need to be done. And so uh, whether it's serve hot dogs make hot dogs, other activities. Um, Jennifer can use the help for Vacation Bible School um, Wednesday night. So that'll, that's June 15th. Also, I printed out a little kind of, they're spread throughout the worship center. There's a a kind of a preaching schedule as far as what text we'll be looking at on what day. Um, Given the fact that we're gonna be rotating um, between a few men to preach the word of God, uh, we had to kind of schedule it out anyway. Um, otherwise, if the next person didn't know where I was going to finish, it would just make things really difficult for them. Uh, but also, I think it'll be helpful for, for the congregation to be able to read the passages ahead of Sunday morning so that they can their hearts can start to, to digest what the Word of God says so they can look ahead and study it and all of these things. Um, and so out in the foyer area, there is kind of a list of where we're going to be on, on what Sunday morning. And then on the flip side of that, uh, we have scheduled some summer fellowships. Um, some are, uh, one is I think in particular on Sunday morning, July 3rd, we're going to have a fellowship after our Sunday morning service, but then the others will be on Wednesday nights. Uh, used to, years ago, when we had Sunday evening church, uh, we would do fellowships after Sunday evening churches in the, in the summer. Um, but given the fact that we do home groups now on, on Sunday afternoons and in evenings, uh, we're going to try to shift some of those fellowships to some of our Wednesday night, um, Wednesday nights. And so uh, you can look at that, pick that up, mark those things down. Also, um, if you would like to help with those things, um, I would love the help. In fact, I would love to say you can be in charge of our roasted corn fellowship and then you plan it and figure those things out. So if you can help in that way, um, we are in a spot to where the church needs to step up and be the church and learn how to minister to one another, love one another, uh, so that all the things that, to be honest, need to happen don't all fall on the four 
people that are in the church office. So um, please, if you, you feel led, or maybe perhaps even if you don't, um, tell me you'll help and we'll, we'll get you plugged in uh, doing things and serving the body together. It's a good time. Um, Ephesians chapter 4 teaches that pastors are to, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, um, which should be very clear to us that when ministry happens, it's the saints ministering to one another and serving one another in love. So um, let's pray together and then we'll begin worshiping today. God, you are good and you are kind and you are gracious to us. God, we can look back on, on the history of our church and just time and again um, see your, your faithfulness to us and providing for us and to giving us a man who proclaims the word of God um, unashamedly. Um, and so, God, you have always been faithful to us. And as we think upon your faithfulness, um, our, our hearts and minds can't help um, but think upon the cross of Calvary upon which Jesus died. It was that cross where our sins were paid for. This, the, the punishment for sin that we deserved was placed upon the Son of God, Jesus Christ, that we might have life, that we might be reconciled unto you, um, that we might be forgiven of sins. God, apart from Christ, we have no hope. And so, God, your faithfulness is on display to your people in the death of your son, Jesus Christ, who laid down his life for us. Um, and so, God, we know and believe that you will continue to be faithful to this church. Um, and God, as, as you are faithful to this church, um, we, we pray for your glory, that you would bring yourself glory through this church through faithful steps of obedience, of families, of daddies, of moms, of grandparents, of, of your body, that as we walk in obedience to your word, um, that you would be glorified and you would bring about your own glory in this community. God, we, we thank you um, for this place. We thank you that it is by your grace that we have an opportunity to gather together as a family. God, teach us what it looks like to be a family, to serve one another, to exhort one another in the word of God, to care for one another, to be kind and patient with one another, to speak truth into each other's lives. God, teach us these things. God, this morning as we gather, we do so with your glory on our mind. I pray that you would be glorified through the reading of your word, through the singing of your word, and through the proclamation of your word. We love you, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.
every valley will be lifted high and the weak will be made strong when you come like lightning in the sky how long oh lord how long kings on earth will scatter when they hear thundering sounds of angel songs hearts will tremble filled with holy fear how long oh lord how long all our hopes are fixed on you that your promises are true and one day you will return all our treasures here will fade so we long to see your face until then our hearts will burn how long oh lord you will conquer every evil thing every sorrow pain and wrong they will cease with your return of king how long oh lord how long all our hopes are fixed on you that your promises are true and one day you will return all our treasures here will fade so we long to see your face until then morning church if you would turn with me to Galatians chapter 5 we're reading from verse 1 through 12 <clears throat> and if you need a Bible there's a Bible in the pew back in front of you it's helpful to follow along as scripture is read For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts cir circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettled you unsettle you. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate them emasculate themselves. Let's pray. Father, I pray this morning that you bless the reading of your word. 
But also, Lord, I pray that you bless the preaching of your word, the singing of your word, and the love that we have here in this room this morning. And by blessing, Lord, I pray that you open minds this morning, minds that are not open, minds that do not know that you are God to those who you need to be revealed to. Also, Lord, I pray that we are blessed by the reading of your word, the preaching of your word, the singing of your word, for our edification, for our growth, that we may serve you well. I pray, Lord, that we know that the truth is real. There is no other truth outside of your truth, that the promises that you do give us are true, that we, as believers, have a future coming to us in your presence, but also, Lord, we have life now, we have hope now, we have peace now, we have comfort even today because of your salvation. I pray that you are honored today in our presence. I pray that we glorify your name as we worship you this morning with our hearts. I pray that we love you with everything that we have, not just here, but everywhere we go. I pray that you give us confidence in your word, give us confidence in our salvation, in our belief in you. I pray that you strengthen our minds that what we know to be true is true. And as we know these truths to be evident in our lives, I pray that they are outwardly evident to those around, of us, around us, that they see that what we stand on, the solid rock that you give us, the firm foundation that you put beneath our feet, the cornerstone of Jesus Christ, is the center of this world. It's the purpose of this world. It's the main meaning of life. That as we live life, it is to be lived for you, not ourselves. That selfish, pur selfish purposes are outside your will. That to desire to do what we want to do for ourselves, to make us ourselves feel better about ourselves is not what you have asked of us. You have given us life. You have given us breath to give you purpose, to glorify your name, to serve you, and to love you, and to reveal you as the one and only true God. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Holy Spirit, breathe on me until my heart is clean. Let sunshine fill its endless heart with not a cloud between. Breathe
morning. A few things I failed to announce. One, I think two weeks from today, we have a business meeting. So I think we're supposed to announce that a few weeks in advance. Um, that meeting, among other things, uh, we will vote on uh, t two deacons that have been renominated or whatever, they're re-upped, and then uh, three, three new deacons. And so be aware of that. Um, also, uh, Mr. Red Holloman and Peaches had their baby yesterday. So praise the Lord uh, for that. Um, let me get this. Is it uh, Sarah Ruth? Sarah Ruth Holloman. Um, so pr praise the Lord. 21 inches, quite the long baby there. Um, 7 pounds, 11? He had to look. He was like, he was going to look. Let me, let me make sure. Um, but, um, man, babies are a blessing from the Lord, um, for sure. Um, and so, one of, like, I just think about the way, one of the ways that God has uh, blessed our, our church. Um, just look around at the, the babies, the kiddos that are in our midst. Um, sometimes, well, a lot of times, if you've had kids or you're a grandparent, kiddos can be exhausting. Um, they can exhaust you. Um, but I think it's, it's perhaps a reminder of how much we exhaust our Heavenly Father through our own whatever. And so, but, but blessing, uh, babies and children are a blessing of the Lord, and so we need to certainly uh, be reminded of that. And so, so praise the Lord uh, for, for the giver of life. Um, so we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 1. Uh, and going through verse 11, this is, there's a lot in these, this text. It's very rich. And so um, whenever I first told Tom and Ryan that I, I wanted to preach on all 11 verses, uh, I, um, well, I, I wanted to because I, I didn't think you could stop at verse 7. That's probably the most natural place that you would stop and then preach 7 through 11. Uh, but I wanted to be able to to get to the good news and why the first six verses um, are, are an issue. Um, and so I, I said that and I got it locked in on the schedule. And then the more I studied and the more I read, I realized, holy smokes, man, we could spend weeks in this passage. Um, and so we're going to uh, cover it all this morning. So Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, let us read together. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write these things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evil doers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have confidence in the flesh, or, sorry, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews as to the law, a Pharisee as to zeal, a persecutor of the church as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Let's pray together. God, you are good and kind. And God, we know and do believe that we can approach you today, not because of a righteousness of our own, but totally 100% 
because of the finished work in Christ Jesus. The finished work of of Christ on Calvary's cross. And by faith in him, God, we have a righteousness that is not our own, but belongs to Christ. For you made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become his righteousness. And God, we praise you today. It's because we have a a righteousness that is external to ourselves, that we can draw near into your presence. God, I pray that you would teach our hearts this morning. The things that we read here would be the heartbeat of our church. It would be the motivation of our preaching. It would be the motivation of our evangelism. That the things we read in this passage would, would grip us. We wouldn't just give verbal assent to these things, but that we would really believe them. We do love you, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we're kind of halfway through at this point, um, the book of Philippians. Uh, in Philippians 1, uh, verse, verses 9 through 11, we see a prayer of the Apostle Paul that I think we see kind of the reason he p- prays that prayer in our text this morning. But this is what he says. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. So he's he praying that they would abound in love. But then he says, with knowledge and all discernment, so that, for this purpose, that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God the Father. And so, at the very beginning of this book, Paul prays, amongst other things, that these believers would have discernment. Now, discernment is a needed skill for the church, and it has been for all ages of church history. Because we know this from the very beginning, Satan hates truth, and he wants to distort truth, particularly among God's people. And we see that in our text this morning. Paul is warning the church of Philippi about false brothers who had begun to creep into some of his churches proclaiming to them a message of righteousness that depends on works of the law, that depend on what you do and your obedience to the law, proclaiming a message that has no power, a message that will, no, will never save. In fact, it's a message that it really keeps you from the need to be saved. It's a message that makes null and void the death of Christ Jesus. And so this is a, a serious matter. And so here's the question before us this morning. It's a question that we all probably need to ask ourselves. When we stand before God one day, and just so you know, we all will stand before God one day. When we do that, what will our confidence be in? What will our confidence be in when we stand before God? You see, this is the battle that's at stake in our text this morning. And to be quite honest, this is something that I think, this idea that our our works, our own works make us righteous before God is perhaps a pretty typical belief in our world and in our culture still today. When we used to go on uh, faith evangelism visits several years ago, we would ask the question, some of you probably still know it, What does it take, or what, in your personal opinion, what does it take for a person to get into heaven and have eternal life? Well, the vast majority of the time, when you ask someone that question, they appeal to their own works of righteousness to justify themselves before God. Well, I've been baptized. We had a conversation one time with a lady. We we would appeal to her, no, 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 it's not what you do. And she would always come back to this, well, I was baptized. Well, I was baptized. Or will I go to church? Or will I do this and this and on and on? And so this, the battle that we read of in our text this morning is not a battle that ended in the first century. Well, the victory has been won, but the battle for the hearts and minds of people is still going on today. And so let's look at it. Chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brothers... Rejoice in the Lord. 
to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Now in verse 1, uh, Paul returns to a theme that undergirds much of this letter. In fact, one of the reasons why we thought it'd be good just to keep walking through the book of Philippians is because it's such a warm, joyful book. This is the third time in these first few chapters that Paul has commanded these believers to be joyful. And they are to rejoice in the Lord. Now, without diving deep into this theme, let me just remark here that it is Christian duty, Christian responsibility to be joyful. Our joy is not circumstantial. Like whatever's going on in my life should have no bearing on the joy that I have in the Lord. Our joy is not personality driven. You say, well, I'm just not a joyful person. It's just not my personality. Well, Christian, that will not cut it. You see, our joy is not based upon circumstances or our personality. Our joy is based upon the finished work of Christ Jesus on Calvary's cross. And so I believe here that when he says to write the same things, Paul is talking about this, this, uh, this need to continue to come back to this idea, you must rejoice. He keeps revisiting this topic. And then he says, this is no trouble for me to say this. It's no cause of hesitation. I'm not going to shrink back from telling you to be joyful. And then he says, it is safe for you. Now this word safe um, can mean to be secure from danger, to be safe from danger, which I think is interesting. As we rejoice in the Lord, that joy that we have in the Lord is our strength. It's our protection. It's our security. It's our safety. And then we get to verse 2. And I think we could ask the question, well, what do they need to be safe from? Well, as we keep reading, we see that one of the things that joy in the Lord protects us from is from trusting in ourselves for our own righteousness. And so when we get to verse 2, there seems to be a very dramatic shift in the tone of this letter. You see, up to this point, this has been a very warm, encouraging letter. Despite being chained and in prison, the letter is very, very hopeful. But then we read verse 2. Philippians chapter 3, verse 2. Paul writes, Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evil doers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. At the end of chapter 2, uh, we have three different commands, um, how these people are to receive Epaphroditus. They are to receive him. It's a command. They are to rejoice, again, at seeing him. And they are to honor such men. Well, in contrast, Paul here uses one verb three different times to command this church to watch out for, to be on high alert against a particular group of people. And tagged to these three different verb, uh, three the same verb three times, are three different terms to describe these men. And so this is what he says. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the dogs. Now this was not a term of endearment. Paul wasn't wanting your mind to go to your fluffy friend at home that is waiting for you as we speak. From J.B. Lightfoot's commentary, this is what he says about this term. He said, The herds of dogs which prowl about eastern cities, without a home and without an owner, feeding on the refuse and filth of the streets, quarreling among themselves and attacking the passerby, explain the applications of this image. And we have that same sort of fill, feel, not fill, when the Bible speaks of dogs, in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 11, a familiar verse, like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. And that proverb that I just read would be an apt description of these dogs that Paul is talking about, who claim to have been saved by God's grace through the finished work of Christ, but are now returning to their own works for their righteousness before God, like a dog returning to its vomit. 
And these false teachers would have been highly offended because this is a term that Jews would often use to describe Gentiles. They are Gentile dogs. And so Paul flips the script here and uses this term for these Judaizers. And then we continue. He says, look out for the evildoers. Again, um, we'll, we'll see here in a second that this was a group of men who were relying and teaching that their own self-righteousness will justify before God. Their own doing of good works. These men saw themselves as servants of righteousness, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15. They were depending on their own religious accomplishments for their confidence before God. And they were, they were teaching that if a Gentile wanted to come to Christ... They needed to do the same thing. And so Paul here, again, flips the script. He's saying, you who think you are a doer of good works are an evil doer. Not only is your righteousness not enough, but you are doing evil by depending upon those things for righteousness. And then Paul continues. He says, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. So this is a term, and then as we will read here in a second in Paul's argument, that I think gives us the most clarity as to the identity of the men that he's talking about, that he's warning them about. See, these men were, were Jews. They were Judaizers uh, that had supposedly been saved by Christ's finished work, but they were now teaching that a Gentile, if a Gentile was to be saved, that Gentile would first basically need to become a Jew. They had to come under the law of Moses. So in a sense, what these people were saying was, as God's people, as Jews, these Gentiles need to become like us first before they can become a Christian. And so they were teaching that unless circumcised, they could never be saved, they could never come to Christ. And this false teaching was spreading like gangrene in the churches. This is what the whole letter of Galatians is about. It was so serious and so deadly, in fact, that the church of Jerusalem pulled together all their elders to discuss this very issue, to make a statement of clarity on this issue. We see this in Acts chapter 15, verse 1. It says, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so Paul calls these teachers who were spreading this false gospel the mutilation. Some translations, the ESV mind says, those who mutilate the flesh. This word, mutilation, it, it actually means a hacking off, a, a cutting off. Certainly, if you were to ask these Judaizers what they were teaching, they would not describe themselves as the mutilation hacking off but that's the word that Paul uses here he's accusing these teachers of requiring people to just hack themselves up to mutilate themselves and what a stinging statement this would have been the apostle Paul goes at the very source of these teachers pride their greatest confidence so had these Judaizers read or heard these things they would have been furious, furious. He calls them dogs. He calls them evildoers, those who mutilate the flesh. And this isn't the only time that the Apostle Paul comes at these men in his letters, very strong with perhaps very vile language. Randy read a passage earlier. In Galatians chapter 5, that Paul says these men should just emasculate themselves. Galatians chapter 1, he says these men should be accursed. They should be damned. And so Paul doesn't mince words when it comes to these false teachers. In today's evangelical world, where it seems like the only heresy is to call something heresy, I'm sure Paul's tone and use of language would cause many in the church to blush. And yet Paul's example here should teach us something. It should teach us to reserve the harshest of criticism and the most intentionally piercing of words 
for those false teachers and churches who are leading people away from the gospel of Jesus Christ down the wide path to destruction. Because, friends, that's what's at stake here. And that's Paul's motivation for the use of his language. You see, the glory of God and the souls of men are at stake. These men were taking the, the glory that was rightly reserved for God and placing it on human beings by saying, in essence, you can do something, you can do something to have your own righteousness. You see, that's what works-based salvation does. It steals God's glory and places it on a human being. Paul continues in verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. In verse 3, Paul uses the term we. And in doing so, he, he's saying we, myself, a, a Jew that is depending on, upon Christ for, for his righteousness, or a Gentile believer. We are, we are all, he says, the circumcision. Now circumcision was the physical, visible mark that identified God's chosen people in the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 17. However, it became such a thing that the Israelites would place their trust and their confidence in this physical circumcision to mark them as God's people, even if their hearts were far from him, chasing after other gods, depending upon other godless nations to protect them and defend them and provide for them. And so it was because of this that God sent prophets like Jeremiah to proclaim to the Jews that circumcision is of the heart. The cutting off of the fleshliness of the heart is really the mark of God's people. And in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 through 29, this is what Paul says. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. And so Paul's point here is that Christians... Those who have been given a new heart, their hearts are circumcised, are the true people of God. We see this in Galatians chapter 3, Romans chapter 11, Ephesians chapter 2. It's not merely those who have participated in the physical act of circumcision. Well, if circumcision is not the mark of God's people, then what is? Well, Paul tells us as he keeps going. He says the first, wor the first mark of, of God's people is they worship by the Spirit of God. Now, when this issue first came up and was dealt with in Acts chapter 15 uh, at the Council of Jerusalem, one of the arguments that were made by the apostles and by the elders is that one did not have to be circumcised to be saved because God has given his Holy Spirit to both Jews and Gentiles alike. And so we read this in Acts chapter 15, verses 7 through 9. He says, and after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made him a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them. How? By giving them the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the Gentiles. Just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. They worship because God has given them the Spirit of God. Secondly, one of the marks of God's people is they glory or they boast in Christ Jesus. And so the circumcision, the true child of God, the Christian, boasts in the Lord, not in themselves, because this person understands that he has nothing to offer God. As Jonathan Edwards said, you contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. And so the, the true Christian boasts in the Lord because they understand that apart from God making us alive together with Christ, Ephesians 2.5, 
Apart from God shining into our hearts the beauty of Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, apart from God causing us to be born again, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3, the Bible teaches that we would still be dead in our sins no matter how many times we circumcise ourselves. We need no other argument. We need no other plea. Right? It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. And so we boast in this Jesus. Thirdly, and flowing perfectly out of the second characteristic of the circumcision of a true Christian, we put no confidence in the flesh. This means that we don't trust in our own abilities. We don't trust in who our parents are. We don't trust in our own works. We don't trust in our church attendance or our baptism and on and on. And this little phrase is the launching pad for the next three verses. In verses 4 through 6, this is what Paul says. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. And so Paul begins listing his achievements that would even oppress these Jews, impress these, these Jews, these Judaizers. You see, these people have confidence in the flesh. Well, here, look at my resume. And then he lists seven different things. The first four were Paul's by birth. The next three were his accomplishments. And so Paul says he has been circumcised according to the command of God on the eighth day, as God tells him to do in Leviticus. Then he mentions that he is of the people of Israel. He wasn't a Gentile. He was a Jew by birth. Thirdly, he mentions that he was, a ben uh, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. This is the tribe that the first king of Israel came from, King Saul. Perhaps he was even named after him. He was of noble ancestry. This was the, the tribe, that the, the land that God allotted for them, that the city of Jerusalem was in. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. Fourthly, Paul claims to be a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was emphasizing that like some of the current Jews who had assimilated into the surrounding Greek culture, almost abandoning their Hebrewness, he hadn't done that. Though he knew Greek, he was educated in the culture, he hadn't abandoned the Hebrew culture. And this is important because many Jews, the Hebrew of Hebrews, would look down upon the Hellenized Jews, who didn't seem to care about their Jewish lineage. But Paul hadn't. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Next, in regard to the law, Paul was a Pharisee. Now, a Pharisee is a, a set-apart one. Um, we read much about them in the Gospels. Um, and, and Paul, in particular, was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. His, his life, his teaching, was law-educated and law-centered. See, a Pharisee's life, their whole motivation for being was to obey the law of God to the very most minute law. And then he says this, as to zeal, he was a persecutor of the church. Paul didn't just say that he was zealous for the glory of God, but he was so zealous for the glory of God, so fervently committed to the law of God, that he wanted everyone to obey the law of God. And if they didn't obey the law of God, he would persecute them. And so he persecuted followers of Christ. And then Paul says, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Now the word righteousness means to fulfill rel religious requirements and, or to do what God has required. And the word blameless means what you would think it means. He was innocent. He was without fault, without error. So there are various views on what exactly Paul means here. Um, one view uh, Paul, uh, that is that Paul means according to the standard of the Pharisees, he's blameless. So some people think that he, he's talking about the law or the, whatever, the standard to which Pharisees would hold people. He's blameless. Another view is that maybe this is what Paul 
thought of himself prior to being born again. So prior to God revealing to him the beauties and wonders and righteousness of Christ, Paul saw himself as being righteous because of his adherence to the law. Still another view would be that he's saying that he is blameless according to the standards that are being forced upon Gentile Christians by these Judaizers. Now, whatever the case, Paul is saying that whatever standard you're throwing at me, I've done it. I'm blameless. And in all of these things that we just read and Paul listed, Paul is proving his point in verse 6. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. But praise the Lord, Paul continues in verse 7. This is what Paul writes. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Whatever things this profited me, all the things in verses 4 through 6, I regarded as loss, or I forfeited it all for the sake of Christ. Now what's interesting is the word gain is actually plural. Whatever gains I had, all these things I've listed, circumcised, the people of Israel, Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, all of those things, add them all together. And for the sake of Christ, they are loss, singular. They're one big loss for the sake of Christ. Now, for the sake of Christ is actually just one word. Um, and it's a common word that indicates purpose or a reason for something. So in essence, Paul is saying, these gains that I once saw as profit, I regarded as loss when Christ saved me. Because my view of Christ and what righteousness is has now changed because of the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. And then he continues in verse 8. Indeed, I count Everything is loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Now, indeed, is actually several different Greek words all smushed together into one English word. And it, it communicates to us emphasis here. Indeed, he says. And then we read almost the same thing that we read in verse 7. It's very similar, but it's not the same. We have the same verb. He says, I counted I regarded, but now we have a different tense. I count, or I regard. I counted, completed action, to I count, present tense verb. In essence, this is what Paul's saying. I counted, and I still count today, everything as loss. You see, Paul hadn't changed his mind in the years since he'd been saved. Every stone that was hurled at him and beat upon his breast, every poisonous word of slander that had ever been saved of him and his character, every drop of blood he shed, even as his hands were in chains while he was in prison when this letter was penned, when I rethink and I account back on everything that I could have been and everything that I could have avoided, I still regard it all as loss. It's still all worth it. Why? Well, he tells us, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Surpassing worth is referencing something of superior or exceeding value. And in in this case, the superior or exceeding value is knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Lord. Now the word for knowing isn't um, just knowing a set of facts about someone or being acquainted with someone. This is an intimate, personal knowing. It's having communion or fellowship with the Lord. Now when Paul compares his own works and achievements and sufferings to that of knowing Christ, it doesn't even compare. They are worthless. And in fact, Paul goes on to use stronger language when describing these words, works that he had achieved, he says, for his sake, the same phrase there, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And so Paul here references not just his accomplishments he listed, but also the trajectory of his life that he gave up 
prior to knowing Christ. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 13, we see that Paul was advancing in Judaism beyond many of his own age. He was on a trajectory where people would look to him, and he already was someone that they looked to. In fact, we see that in Acts chapter 6 and Acts chapter 7 when they looked to Paul for the approval of the slaughtering of Stephen. But when Paul, when God saved Paul, all that was gone. The trajectory that he was on in his life, it was over. Once esteemed as a Pharisee, he was now stricken. He was despised and persecuted in the same manner he once persecuted the same, uh, he was once persecuted with the same zeal he once persecuted. Was he disappointed in the loss of these things? No. He counted them as rubbish. This is another strong word here that actually means excrement or dung. The loss of all things. Friend, if it means gaining Christ, the Apostle Paul would tell us he once counted it and he still today counts it as loss. It's worth it. And for those in this room, if you've never come to faith in Christ, if you're not a Christian, whatever is keeping you from coming to Christ, be it sin or be it pride or be it shame, give it up. Christ is far better. And this room is full of people who would echo the Apostle Paul and tell you Christ is far better. He is of supreme value. And so if you repent and you place your faith in Christ, you will not miss whatever is hindering you from coming to Christ Jesus. Paul has done the math for us. For those of us who aren't good at math, He has done the math for us. He's added it all up. Christ it is. He is better. And he continues in verse 8. He says, And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. To be found in Christ. To be found in Christ. The word found is actually where the word eureka comes from. Eureka. I have found something. I have discovered something. Now here, Paul is not discovering anything. He's not finding anything. Christ, but rather he is to be found, or he is being found in Christ. Paul is referencing a future day when all will stand before the judgment seat of God, Romans chapter 14. A day in which the wrath of God's judgment will be revealed, and he will render each one according to his works, Romans chapter 2. It is on that day that Paul desires to be found with his confidence in Christ, and in the finished work of Christ Jesus on Calvary's cross. He doesn't want to be found in himself, depending on his own self-righteousness, but rather he wants to be found in Christ. Well, why? Well, first of all, because according to the Bible, there is no righteousness apart from the external righteousness that we receive in Christ. There is no one righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, when compared to the perfect righteousness of God, we are but filthy, depraved sinners. Even those good things that we think we do, those righteous acts we think we do, are but filthy rags in the eyes of God. Our own righteousness will never cut it. And see, this is what the false teachers were missing. They believed that their adherence to the law would be enough. But it's, it's not. To be found in Christ is to become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is our only hope. Ask any teenager around here, what is your only hope in life and in death? 
And they will tell you, if they don't, they'll be in trouble, but they will tell you that we belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to God and to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. This is our only hope. And so have you ever acknowledged you're a sinner? Have you ever recognized that you can never live up to God's standard of righteousness? Have you ever placed your confidence in Christ and his finished work on Calvary's cross? You see, Christ died on Calvary's cross to bear the penalties for the sins of his people. And it's not because you have your own righteousness. It's because you can never have your own righteousness. So repent, friend, and put your faith in Christ. If you do this, Christ's righteousness will be yours, according to the Bible. And so for those who have faith in Christ, the next few verses, and we're going to have to skip a rock over these things, reveal all that salvation entails. In chapter 9, it says, Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul here is speaking of justification, which the whole book of Romans is about. When one has faith in Christ, they are justified by God. They are declared righteous by God, as if they themselves have lived Christ's perfect life. You see, the righteousness of Christ was applied to your account if you have faith. A righteousness that comes through faith in Christ, it all depends on faith. Do you have faith in Christ? You see, without faith in Christ, you are depending on your own righteousness, and that will not end well. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Paul could be speaking about sanctification here, this process of growing in Christ's likeness. You see, as we get to know the Lord better, that I may know him, the better we know the Lord, friend, the better we know our own hearts. And we realize that we are sinners. It grows in us a distaste for our sin when the knowledge of the Lord increases. And as we get to know the power of the resurrection, as we share in the suffering, of, uh, the sanctifying effects of suffering for the cause of Christ, what happens is we begin to want to mortify our own sinful passions. We want to die to self Every day we will realize, like Paul, to live as Christ, but to die is gain because we lose our sin then. We get to be like Christ then. Chapter 3, verse 11, he says that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And this is the glorification of the believer. This is what Paul speaks of and describes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We are raised imperishable and in glory. Death, death will ultimately be swallowed up. The good work that God has begun in us, that Paul speaks of in Philippians chapter 1, will be completed on that great day. And so we have the justification, sanctification, and glorification of the believer for those who have faith in Christ Jesus. So what do we do with all of these things? Well, first of all, is this the message of our lives? Is this, is this the motivation of our evangelism? Understanding and recognizing that everyone is lost and headed to hell apart from an external righteousness by having faith in Christ. If this is our motivation, why are we not sharing this message if we believe it to be true? Why are we more concerned about teaching our kids morality and making sure they know how to act when those things will never save them, rather than pleading with them to cast themselves upon the finished work of Christ Jesus? Secondly, what if I were to ask you, Christian, what your life was about? What is the aim of your life? Is it the aim of your life to know Christ? Is it the aim of your your life to know the power of his resurrection and the mortification of sin in our lives. Well, how do I know what my life is about? Well, what do you spend your time doing? If the aim of your, Christ, if the aim of your life is to know Christ, I will find you reading the word of God. 
meditating upon the Word of God, talking to other believers in Christ about the Word of God, living the Word of God out in your life, wherever it is you work, whatever it is you're doing. Thirdly, church, have discernment and don't be afraid to call a spade a spade, according to the scriptures, of course. We need to know and warn people when someone is preaching a false gospel. We need to be willing to call out the idols of our day, many of which have crept into churches. We can't let the world calling us mean or intolerant and whatever else they will call us keep us from speaking the truth of God because the glory of God and the souls of men are at stake. And then finally and most importantly, what is your confidence in? Do you think one day when you stand before God that your church attendance will be enough, that your baptism will be enough, that your tithing will be enough. If that is the case, you won't withstand the fury of God's judgment. Those things are not enough. Nothing you can do in this life will be able to plead your own case. And so I beg you, have faith in Christ. See, it's only if you are found in Christ will you escape the just wrath of God that is being stored up for sinners. So have faith in Christ. Let's pray together. God, you are so good to us. God, you, you sent your son Jesus to die on Calvary's cross that people might be forgiven of sins. And then God, in your grace, you make us alive together with Christ. You give us the very faith we need according to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse, verses 8 through 10. You give us the very faith that we need in order to be justified before you. So God, this morning as we sing, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move. I pray that your Holy Spirit would give people faith who don't have it. Faith in Christ. That they might be justified before you, declared righteous, not because of their own works, because of the finished work of Christ Jesus. God, this is our desire as a church. As many in here would tell people who are lost. It is worth it. Christ is worth it. God, we pray that all these things would be to your glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Stand as we sing. I'll be standing right, right down here. And if anyone wants to talk about the gospel, about Jesus, I will gladly let my children run around here for hours to talk to you about what Christ, who Christ is and what he's done. He is your only hope in life and in death. Let's sing.
Will you pray with me? Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for this great day. Thank you for the freedom that we have to come and worship you. And Lord, um, your word spoke today, and I hope uh, the Holy Spirit works with those that, uh, you know, think that you got to be a good person to get into heaven because that's not what it takes, Lord. Um, and help us as Christians to talk to one another about you, Lord. Uh, I know I fall short on doing that, and I need to get better about it and share your word, Lord. Lord, uh, be with us as we go throughout this week, and for the ones that are traveling, be with them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.